everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is the Senate Environmental Finance. The 3rd of October, 2022. This is an informational meeting only, so there will be no actions taken. Um, what it's going to be with regards to is the, uh, um, the emission standards uh, with the MPCA uh, and the administration uh, rulemaking authority, and it's something that's nothing new to the members, I believe. Uh, we've talked about this before. In fact, I think it's I was trying to think about how long we've been talking about this, but at least two, maybe even three years. Uh, and we've had several, I think, real good discussions. But there has been some changes as of late, and that's why we're here. We want to know uh, and get a little better feel from the uh, administration here as to what and how they're going to be moving forward. So I'm sorry. I guess nobody heard me. They didn't, didn't. Yeah, you see it. All right. Step away from the cup. Step away, for a, step away for a couple of months. This is what happens, I guess. I apologize. It's still not ready. Right. Meanwhile. No, mean meanwhile. better okay everybody okay sounds that way how about the crowd way in the back you hear okay very good well first of all we'll start out uh, and welcoming the uh, commissioner MPCA along with staff um, who is going to be doing a, a short presentation here and then we're going to open it up for questions and and uh, voice voice concerns if there are any members um, so with that, uh, welcome to the committee, Commissioner. Please Thank identify you. yourself and we'll go right ahead. Thank you, Chair Ingerbritson and members of the committee. Good morning. I am Minnesota Pollution Control Agency Commissioner Katrina Kessler. And with me today is MPCA Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate, Craig McDonald, and Climate Director Frank Kolash. We appreciate the opportunity to be here to provide an update to the committee on Minnesota's clean cars standards. Next slide. I want, to I want to start with a quick overview of Minnesota's clean cars standards adopted last year. Clean Cars Minnesota includes two components. First is a requirement for auto manufacturers to continue producing lower emitting, cleaner, more fuel efficient vehicles and to continue delivering those models for sale here in Minnesota. These are known as the low emission vehicle or LEV standards and establish tailpipe emission standards for vehicles sold in the state. Second is a requirement for auto manufacturers to gradually increase the number of electric vehicles available in Minnesota. These are known as the zero emission vehicle or ZEV standards. We have seen in other states that the adoption of ZEV standards leads to an increase of availability in the variety of EV models. The Clean Car Minnesota a rule applies to manufacturers. The Clean Cars Minnesota standards do not require any individual dealer to have EVs on their lot. 
Clean Cars Minnesota is not making Minnesotans purchase a new EV. It is not outlawing internal combustion engines. It is not regulating tractors or combines or small engines like lawnmowers, chainsaws, boats, or all-terrain vehicles. It is not taking away people's F-250s or Silverado trucks. It is not taking away people's snowblowers and landscaping equipment. It is simply giving Minnesotans more choices, supporting our EV businesses, and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. We began the rulemaking process to adopt Minnesota clean car standards in 2019 in response to a rollback of federal vehicle emission standards that began in 2018. Clean Cars Minnesota standards are part of a multi-pronged approach to reduce emissions in the transportation sector and to meet the goals of the 2007 Bipartisan Next Generation Energy Act. Accomplishing our goals requires a build-out of our EV charging infrastructure, accelerating and incentivizing EV sales in Minnesota, investing in cleaner fuel options like biofuels while we transition to EVs, and better coordinating our regional and national initiatives to expand EV charging opportunities. Reducing emissions from the transportation sector requires public and private sector to work together. Minnesota utilities, including Minnesota Power, Excel Energy, and Great River Energy have been leading the way with initiatives to help Minnesotans connect their EVs to renewable energy. Expanding EV and charging opportunities allows Minnesota to leverage the strong work of our utility partners to reduce emissions from the electric generation sector in our state. The adoption of Clean Cars Minnesota helps build Minnesota's market for electric vehicles and prepare our economy for the future of transportation. Clean Cars Minnesota gives customers more access to EVs and also helps Minnesotans who choose an EV save money on their transportation fuels. Next slide. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the differences between Minnesota's Clean Car Standards and California's Advanced Clean Cars 2 Standards. In August, of this year's, Cal in August of this year, California announced updates to its standards known as Advanced Clean Cars 2. This update changes their tailpipe emission standards, again known as LEV, to reduce harmful air pollutants that are not greenhouse gases. It also changes California's ZEV standards to require the percentage of cars sold in California to be 35% electric in model year 2026 and 100% electric by model year 2035. California's adoption of advanced car cars clean to means that Minnesota's clean car Minnesota standards will sunset after model year 2025 at which time the federal tailpipe standards will apply in Minnesota. Meaning starting in model year 2026, Minnesota will be subject to the federal tailpipe emission standards. Currently we don't know what the federal green, greenhouse gas emission standards will be for model year 2027 and beyond. EPA has indicated that they will be making a draft of a proposal for updating the federal standards available next spring. I want to be clear that Minnesota clean cars rules do not position the state to automatically adopt the new advanced clean cars rules. As we've stated before, we are focused on implementing the clean cars Minnesota a rule adopted last year, building out EV infrastructure and working to expand markets for cleaner fuels like biofuels in Minnesota. We do not have a plan to adopt clean cars to standards at this time. We've always said that we will work to reduce emissions in the transportation sector in a way that makes sense for Minnesota. Next slide. Minnesota's clean car standards are focused on increasing choices for consumers and preparing our economy for the future of transportation. A growing number of auto dealers in different parts of Minnesota recognize this fact and are supportive of the efforts to embrace electric vehicles. These quotes from Chris Gulbrunson, president of Apple Autos in Apple Valley, and Paul Bloomquist, owner of CNM and Roseau County Fort, demonstrate this support. Next slide. Our commitment to clean car standards is also good for Minnesota because it creates and supports high-paying jobs. 
Minnesota is home to 16 companies connected to the EV supply chain that provide more than 3,300 EV manufacturing jobs. That includes Philips and Temro in Eden Prairie that build EV charging stations and EV battery heaters, Zeus Electric Chassis in White Bear Lake that is building the next generation of work trucks, Rosenbauer in Wyoming that has developed an all-electric fire truck, and Windings in New Ulm that builds electric transmissions for hybrids and propulsion for EVs. Minnesota's investment in electric vehicles and the adoption of clean car standards will continue to support our growing EV business sector and create jobs. Next slide. So looking forward, 13 car manufacturers have already submitted information to receive early action credits that are available as part of Clean Cars Minnesota based on the number of model year 2021 electric vehicles that they've delivered to the state. The list includes Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, among others. I just want to say one more time that Minnesota's standards do not automatically adopt the Advanced Clean Cars 2 standards. We remain focused on implementing the Minnesota Clean Car standards and giving Minnesotans more choices while supporting our EV businesses and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. As indicated, we are expecting a new draft of a federal vehicle emission standard to be proposed in the first half of 2023. Once those standards are available for review, Minnesota will be better able to understand the options available to the state to reduce emissions and ensure consumers have the access to the cleanest cars available. Next slide. I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity to provide the update, and we're happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Thank you very much for the uh, for the presentation. Um, I'm not sure it's cleared up everything here, but members, uh, do we have any questions at all or any concerns before we move forward? I'm sorry, Senator Dibble. Uh, no, uh, Mr. Chair, that was from before when I was uh, trying to indicate that the audio was turned off. So yeah, we just 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 got it on here a short time ago, so uh, we apologize for that. Right. Uh, nothing for the moment. Um, I assume the PCA will be sticking around. I might have some questions later. Yes, if we can call them back to the table. Thanks. Right. A uh, question that I have, and I have, have several here. Um, For a long time, I would say over the last couple of years, <clears throat> in talking with <clears throat> excuse me, constituents and, and people throughout the state of Minnesota, and their, their concern about electric vehicles uh, is, uh, I think, pretty loud, actually. Quite, uh, quite a few people are hearing about that, and they're asking questions as to uh, why we are <clears throat> following the uh, standards of California. Can you, uh, can you help me clear that up a little bit more? Now, you said California uh, emission standards are, are uh, actually uh, very stringent. And, and uh, do, we have a, uh, do we have a choice as to whether we are going to be doing that through rules? Um, are we going to be following California? Or are we going to be reverting back to the federal? And if we're going to be reverting back to the federal, uh, that, that I understand is only for one year, is that correct? Maybe you can help me with that. Uh, Chair Ingerbritson and members of the committee, um, just stepping back, I think the initial question is, do we have a choice? And um, there is a choice. You can choose to adhere to the federal emission standards. The other choice, which a number of states had taken, is following the California approach. Um, as I noted in the testimony, our, because California has changed their standards, our standards that we adopted last year will sunset, and then at that time we will follow the federal standards. So you will not be following the California standards, and they're more stringent, I understand, than the federal standards, is that correct? Um, Chair Ingerbretson, at this time, we do not have a plan to adopt the Advanced Clean Cars 2 standards that California adopted in August of this year. Okay. At one time, there was, there was the thought of doing that. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit as to why we were even uh, comparing ourselves with, with California? Obviously, 
the real obvious things are, you know, the weather, uh, the number of cars. <clears throat> uh, when you visit California, you see uh, very small vehicles. Uh, generally, they're all, you know, I suppose they're hybrids, whatever, but they're a lot different than, than Minnesota. There's 40 million cars in, in California versus 4 million in Minnesota. And, and again, the uh, public seems to, to throw the question out, why, why would we follow California? And can you give me a little idea as to why we were heading that direction? And I know that the administration can do that uh, with the authority of rulemaking. Um, but I, I guess people are still wondering, and, and uh, there are some viewers, I think, watching today. Uh, just tell them why we were following California with regards to emissions. And I know they have a lot of issues out there, certainly. I mean, you, you look at Los Angeles and San Francisco, you see an awful lot of smog and a lot of fog. and Not fog, but smog. <clears throat> uh, so why, why a Midwestern state following California? And now I guess I understand that New York is as well. Uh, Chair Ingbritson, thanks for the question. I'll just reiterate that we began the process of adopting the Clean Cars Minnesota rule in 2019, which was in response to an action by the federal government that they took in 2018 to roll back the federal tailpipe emission standards. So again, we have a choice to follow the federal standards. And at the time we began the rulemaking, we saw that they were going the opposite direction of our goals in Minnesota, including the 2007 Bipartisan Next Generation Energy Act. So at that time, we began the process of adopting the alternate standards. As noted, because of the action that California has taken now, we have to proactively take that action in order to continue to follow the California path. And at this point, we are focused on implementing Clean Cars Minnesota, and we do not have a plan at this time to adopt advanced Clean Cars 2. Okay. Uh, Clean Cars Minnesota, how has that been working out? I know there's some, some money that is, that is given to those that buy electric cars. Can you, can you explain to me what, what kind of an impact that has been so far? Yeah, Chair Ingerbritson, I'm going to ask our um, Director Colash to answer that question. I'll just note that in my testimony, I said that we do have the early action credits available and that 13 mm -hmm. manufacturers have already indicated interest in that. But for more specifics, I'll ask um, Director Colash to weigh in. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And for the record, my name is Frank Colash, Climate Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, so we adopted the rule in 2021. So this is really the, the first year that we have uh, been under uh, the waiting period for that rule. And what we have seen, again, as Commissioner Kessler noted, that uh, 13 of the manufacturers are uh, proactively participating in the reporting functions that will allow them to access the early early action credits that will help them for their compliance year in model year 2025 when they come into place for the zero emission vehicle standards. We've also seen an increase in the, num in the sales of EVs by the registration. So uh, prior to the rule, we were uh, closer to the 1% to 2% range, and now we are above 4% with the latest data on EV sales. So uh, obviously, we can't make a direct uh, causation correlation there, but we do think that that represents the interest and the purposes of the Clean Cars Minnesota moving in, moving Minnesota in the direction of achieving higher consumer choice and consumer purchases of electric vehicles in Minnesota. So um, w what's your thought process when it comes to uh, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is is uh, the the market market based uh, anything for that matter, not only cars, but anything. Let the market work. It will work its way if it's such a good thing. Um, are you encouraged by that a low percentage of cars that, 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 are, that are out there now versus, I mean, was that something you thought was going to be more than that? Or um, it's kind of, a, kind of a loaded question, but um, do you agree or disagree that the market would be able to handle this without any, any mandates whatsoever? Uh, Chair Ingerbritson, I'll respond and say that, as I noted in our testimony, through the rulemaking process, we did some benchmarking in other states and found that more electric vehicles were and are for sale in states where they have something analogous to Clean Cars Minnesota. 
So I think an increase in the sales in electric vehicles is encouraging. Okay. I'll take one, Mr. Chair. Senator, uh, I'm sorry, I do have a list. Senator Torres Ray. Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have a couple of questions. Um, one related to the statement that you made, um, Mr. Chair, that um, Minnesotans are very concerned about um, us adopting a standards uh, from California. Uh, my understanding, and I would like to ask um, uh, the testifiers, how many hearings did you have? And how many times did you actually hear concerns from Minnesotans about California? And I wanna say this because we're not doing that. And so I, I, am, I am quite um, surprised, Mr. Chair, that you have heard from Minnesotans that we are actually adopting um, standards from California when we are not. And uh, my, my district um, is very interested actually in adopting uh, very strong standards in Minnesota. And uh, they, um, I have not heard absolutely one complaint, but the opposite, that we're not doing enough, that we are not acting enough. And as a matter of fact, I have several constituents who really want to buy a car here and are in a waiting list. And this morning, I heard that there are many, so this is my second question. The first one is how many hearings have we had and when did we hear complaints about us adopting these standards? And the second one is related to the, to the waiting lists of cars. My understanding is that there is a two um, uh, particular uh, groups. One is um, more of a rural, request for uh, pickup trucks because people are very, very concerned about distance and uh, this, the expense of gas and they want to have electric uh, cars and there is a, a very long waiting list for these pickup trucks. And the other one is uh, more, you know, in, in uh, people who have uh, short commutes that are interested in having very small cars. So could you elaborate on both? Uh, you know, how many hearings and have you heard these complain about adopting these standards? I hear the opposite. And um, with respect to the market, um, is it true that we have a waiting list that people really want to have access to these cars in here? Uh, could you tell us more about it? Thank you. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Torres Ray, thank you for the question. I will say that I've been in this role for less than a year, and I believe this is my third hearing talking about this topic. And I will let uh, Director Kolash and Assistant Commissioner um, McDonald speak to this because I know that they and the previous commissioner expended many, many hearings on this topic. And I will say that the rulemaking process that the agency went through, which was um, months and months included comments from people in addition to hearing from people in hearings. And we are hearing uh, from people across the state that they are interested in more choices. And there are always going to be people who have other opinions, but I think resoundingly we are hearing that people want to have more options as they think about what they want to, choices they want to make for vehicles into the future. And then anecdotally, I also have heard that there is a long waiting list for people who are interested in, in electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles and new vehicles. Generally, I think the supply chain concerns are, are real. And I will ask um, Assistant Commissioner McDonald if he has more to add on the number of hearings and concerns. Yeah. Commissioner, welcome. Thank you. For the record, my name is Craig McDonald. I serve as Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate Policy at the PCA. And I would just add two um, clarifying thoughts to Commissioner Kessler's remarks here. We've had multiple legislative hearings and as part of the rulemaking for advanced clean cars, so the rule that we adopted, we had seven different meetings across the state during the request for comment period and two hearings as part of the administrative law judge hearings. And at that time, we did hear that folks really wanted these cars and were unable to get these cars in Minnesota. So that was one of the resounding pieces of information that we heard. But as Commissioner Kessler noted, we of course heard some opposition as well. In regards to the waiting list, I too have anecdotally heard that there are waiting lists for these vehicles. Uh, notably, I believe Ford actually had to stop taking uh, uh, requests for the Ford F-150 Lightning um, because the waiting list was so large. So that's something that many, many people want. Sure. Senator Torres-Ray, follow-up? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I would love to uh, suggest to the committee that we have a hearing uh, with uh, representatives from uh, the fourth company and all others who, who really have a large stake in the state of Minnesota, who really want to to hear, you know, our our interest or our concern about these issues. Um, I do hear that a lot, and uh, I think it's important to have those perspectives because without them, it seems like we are just um, headed in one direction, just to hear one perspective about the people who are concerned. I want to hear about the people who really want this uh, as well. And, and I also want to have more than anecdotal evidence because I don't think that we should um, we should uh, act on anecdotal evidence. I think we should get some numbers, and I think it's to the best interest of the state of Minnesota, you know, to the future of our planet, and um, really to support industries that are fast growing in other states, and we need to be competitive. So I, I encourage, um, you know, not only um, our committee, but also uh, you, Commissioner, to uh, help us put together some concrete evidence about uh, people's opinion about these issues. I know, I heard that there has been more than 100 hearings, but probably I didn't read this correctly, but I understand that there has been, uh, you know, a number of meetings and hearings related to this. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, you uh, Senator. And just to clarify, my, my, um, my interest or my, my statement about folks that I talk to, of course, are most generally rural folk, uh, uh, yours being metro, uh, are somewhat, going you know, to certainly be somewhat different. Uh, and you can imagine um, when I hear the comment that, well, it's cars now, but soon it's going to be something else. It's going to be pickups, soon it's going to be, it's going to be uh, combines, soon it's going to be uh, heavy duty tractors. Uh, we all know that once you open the door, it's, it's going to be uh, happening. And I, frankly, I, I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, if, if the market says and people are able to afford an electric vehicle, I'm all for it. That's, that's just fine. That's a choice. They just don't seem to like the heavy-handed. And I'm not saying it's real heavy-handed, but they don't like the idea of the state saying uh, things like, we're going to adopt standards from above all places, quite frankly, California or New York, uh, because we are way different. We just really are. Um, at least the common thinker out there thinks that. And I, and I represent those people like you do as well. So um, when we start talking about doing those kind of things, uh, you can imagine they sit there and they have coffee and pretty soon uh, uh, you know, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and, and uh, sometimes uh, folks don't trust. They don't trust what goes on down here in St. Paul or Washington, D.C., for that matter. So uh, that's where some of these conversations come from. And I think, they're, I think they sh we should be listening to that. And, and I understand the rulemaking process. They have an opportunity to come to the, come to the meetings. Uh, I think most of them probably were hybrid or... or uh, Zoom meetings uh, over the last couple of years, so it uh, made a, made for a good opportunity, I suppose, for more people to participate. Um, but anyhow, um, what we haven't considered, and, and I think maybe somebody's going to ask this question, is the cost to the consumer. You know, it's always real, real easy to throw something out there <clears throat> and not consider the consumer. And I'll give you a little, little history. And Senator Dibble was here at the time when, when uh, Senator excuse me, Governor, then Governor Pawlenty uh, came out with the standards in 2007, 2007, 2007, I believe, requiring the power companies to come up with uh, uh, alternative standards, alternative electricity, other than coal and fossil. And uh, there was a lot of discussion going on at that time. Uh, and I remember that vote like it was yesterday because I was one of the three that voted against it. And the reason I voted against it was because I couldn't get from anybody's testimony how much it was going to cost, how much the ratepayers were going to pay. And as it turns out, according to the studies now, we've paid a lot for that. So we shouldn't be, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to do rulemaking, we should, we should throw in what it's going to cost and what our consumers, uh, the, one, the people that are paying our bills, what they're going to have to pay. So 
With that, I'll move on to uh, Senator Dibble. Um, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I, I'm forced to, uh, to wonder um, why we're having this hearing. I think it's uh, pretty straightforward. We heard from Commissioner Kessler that um, California is adopting uh, something that's specific to California. And um, there are no plans to uh, follow suit in Minnesota. And I think that's kind of the end of the story. Um, and so I don't know why we're, we're uh, plowing uh, this ground that we've plowed many, 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 many times in this hearing. Um, you don't like the clean car standards. That's well established. Um, Minnesotans do, though. And that was proven by the literally dozens upon dozens of hearings, as well as um, the court proceedings that we've been through, whether that's administrative law judge or other court proceedings. And, um, and uh, we also know that um, it will result in a great benefit uh, to our climate and to our consumers and to our public health. That's been established and that's a matter of record as well. Um, some of your comments, Mr. Chair, would imply that we don't have air pollution in Minnesota. We do, and people die from it. Um, and some of your comments would imply that people are resistant to market interventions uh, when a new technology needs to a, a little bit of a boost, whether that's in the form of policy um, uh, or in the form of of resources. Um, I would just call your attention, Mr. Chair, to the fact that uh, ethanol is uh, pushed through mandates. Um, we mandate uh, certain ethanol blends. Um, we've required our state agencies to um, use bi uh, biodiesel in, in their trucks and buses. And uh, we clear the ground, clear the, clear the decks of a lot of regulatory uh, matters to facilitate the development and the manufacture of ethanol, and we subsidize ethanol directly. So um, Minnesotans support these kinds of policies and, and taxpayer support uh, when something needs a little bit of a boost as we start transitioning to what would ultimately become um, you know, the, the domain of consumer choice and, and the free market, which we all agree is, is superior. Um, but uh, when things are first starting out, um, and there's a large public benefit, it's in the public's interest, there's a public good, we create policies. Um, and sometimes we even support those policies with um, some, some resources for a period of time. But I come back to my original statement and I'll just ask uh, Commissioner Kessler or whomever else at the table would like to respond. Are we talking, is there anything new here that we're discussing? I mean, there's something happening in California, but there's nothing new happening in Minnesota, am I correct? Chair Ingerbritson and Senator Dibble, um, we primarily provided an update, just again reiterating that we are focused on implementing the Minnesota Clean Cars standards, which have not changed based on uh, the adoption of California's new standards. The, the one primary update is that because of California's action, if we don't take a proactive action, we will ultimately get on the path of the federal tailpipe emission standards. I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Kessler froze for a while. Is, is the ball back in my court? I, I didn't hear most of what she said. Uh, sure. Uh, Chair Ingerbritson and Senator Dibble, what I said was that um, the update today is that we remain focused on implementing Clean Cars Minnesota. The content of Clean Cars Minnesota has not changed. The only difference as of the action that California has taken is that um, in model year 2025, our, our standards will sunset and we will follow the federal tailpipe emission standards unless we proactively take another action. Mr. Chair, could I ask one more question? Sure. Yes. Um, assume that's a yes. Um, so is it, 
even though the uh, the Minnesota Clean Cars uh, rules and, and standards, which are Minnesotans, by the way, because Minnesota went through a lengthy process of vetting and hearings, et cetera. So I don't want to hear any conversation about California. This is a Minnesota uh, rule because um, it, a lot of time was taken to confer with Minnesotans about whether or not this was a good idea and something they wanted and needed. Um, so even though it might end sooner than, than anticipated, is it fair to say that um, some public benefit uh, will result in the form of uh, sending the kinds of signals to the marketplace, uh, giving consumers more choice, which, by the way, I will add editorially that consumers will save money in the form of uh, cars that no longer need uh, as much uh, uh, extensive repairs in the form of fuel costs and in the form of cleaner air, which costs a lot of us a lot of money, uh, as well as sending the market signal um, to support uh, electric vehicles with the kind of infrastructure charging stations they need. Those kinds of benefits will happen even if our clean cars rolls end sooner than we anticipated. Is that correct? So, so Commissioner, go ahead. Uh, Chair Ingerbritson and Senator Dibble, I will respond by saying that um, as the percentage of electric vehicles and um, low emitting vehicles in Minnesota increase, the air pollution from transportation will decrease, which is consistent with the goals we have as part of the 2007 Bipartisan Next Generation Energy Act, and it will have a health benefit in terms of air pollution as well. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So. Commissioner, there's got to be some clarity here. Do we have a Minnesota standard now or don't we? Mr. Chair, yes. The standard in place is called the Minnesota Clean Car Standard. And that's going to be for how long of a period from now? Mr. Chair, the, the standard, the Clean Cars Minnesota Standard will be in effect through model year 2025. So, so one, one more year, unless we go with California. So the... The model years are different than the calendar years. Yep. So um, when I say it will end at the end of model year 2025, that is the end of calendar year 2024. Right. And at that time, Minnesota will revert back to the federal emission standards unless a proactive action is taken to adopt the advanced Clean Cars 2 standards. Okay. Mr. Chair, can I follow up on that sure. question? Um, so is that standard already currently adopted? Is it in place? Do the manufacturers have to follow? No, my understanding was it isn't fully adopting and there is some litigation on that. That was gonna be one of my questions when it got to my turn for questions was on the litigation. I know the Minnesota Auto Dealers Association is in litigation with the agency on that, um, opposing the rule. Can you update us on where that's at as well as much as you possibly can? Commissioner. Uh, Chair Ingerbretson and Senator Eichhorn, thanks for the question. So there is a um, waiting period once the rule becomes effective, and um, Director Kolash can speak to the exact timing of all of that. But just to very succinctly say, yes, um, the Minnesota Auto Dealers Association has sued the agency, so we are in litigation with them. Mr. Chair, so are, those, are the rules in place, or is there a hold on the rules being implemented until that litigation is completed? Commissioner. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Ingerbritson. The rules are in place. They were adopted in, in 2021, and they were made effective in 2021. So the first model year that they will apply to for Minnesota is model year 2025. And that's because federal law requires a two-year waiting period for the automobile manufacturers to have adequate notice of the application of the standards in the state. So they are in place. They will remain in place. They have not been uh, stayed or anything by the uh, litigation with the Auto Dealers Association. So, thank you for that, Mr. Kolash. I, that's where the one year thing comes from me, is that it's going to be in effect actually for one model year car. And then we're going to decide whether we're going to be reverting back to the federal or following the California standards. Is that right? Commissioner? Yeah, Mr. Chair, you are correct. Yeah. Okay. Seems like an awful lot of uh, um, business here, an awful lot of things going on just for one year. I'm, <clears throat> I'm a little, a little uh, uh, questioning that. I, I, the rulemaking decision, and Senator, Senator Dibble 
just threw out that it was going to be a lot cheaper. I, I've also got a uh, a report here from a group that did a uh, electric or did a, a study on electric cars, and their the report found that consumers will be paying an average of three thousand eight hundred and eighty eight dollars extra per year every single year throughout two thousand and fifty under Governor Wells's proposal at a total of three hundred and thirteen billion dollars to Minnesota families and businesses. Can you answer to that, uh, Commissioner? Chair Ingerbritson, I will note that as part of the adoption of the Clean Cars Minnesota standards through the rulemaking process, we had to develop a statement of need and reasonableness, and cost was discussed. And I will ask uh, Assistant Commissioner McDonald to, to describe that. Commissioner McDonald. Chair Ingerbritson and members, uh, as part of the statement of need and reasonableness, as Commissioner Kessler said, we did look at uh, the cost to consumers for purchasing an electric vehicle. And as you noted, there is an upfront cost. Uh, an electric vehicle is more expensive currently than an internal combustion engine. However, our analysis showed over the life of the vehicle, consumers would actually see a, see a cost savings um, by purchasing that vehicle. And that's due to, as we saw, reduced fuel consumption, reduced operations and maintenance uh, primarily. So you actually see a benefit um, in terms of your cost savings. That same article, um, uh, Deputy Commissioner, also said something about uh, uh, the governor adopting the standards of uh, <coughs> wind, solar, and battery storage mandate, uh, which California currently has. and, and as you know, California is uh, now having rolling blackouts. Is that considered also into your cost? Uh, Chair Ingebrigtsen, that was not should considered. That, should that happen? I'm sorry, I should finish that. Uh, should that have happened? Go, go oh. ahead. <laughs> so, Chair Ingebrigtsen, uh, that was not part of our consideration as this statement of need and reasonableness for this. We primarily looked at, as we said, those costs to consumers for purchasing the vehicles. I can't speak to the study that you're citing here. We'd be happy to take a look at it and respond to that. Um, as you know, as part of the Administrative Procedures Act, we follow a prescribed set of uh, standards and policies for the rulemaking, and the administrative law judge um, affirmed that the Minnesota rulemaking for the clean cars rule was done correctly. Yeah, this is a report from the uh, Center of American Experiment, uh, and I can certainly give that to you. Uh, and it's quite alarming some of the things that are that are um, that are brought up here, <clears throat> uh, and and the administration just kind of setting aside uh, the cleanest uh, energy source possible, which is um, which is uh, um, nuclear. And now I know there's some some new. Uh, studies going on, a new, I think, new uh, science out there, a new industry uh, where it's actually looked at as, as more of a positive thing than it has been in the past. Now, I know I think we're still in a moratorium where we can't even talk about it here in Minnesota. Um, so I guess, you know, considering all that and, and, and going through the rulemaking process, uh, you, you would think that you would look at the possibility of overloading uh, our system should we have those or end up with too many cars. And I've also heard that from industry as well. I've heard that, that, you know, we're just not going to be able to be able to uh, uh, take the load if, if these mandates were to go through and we were to require that many cars on the, on the, on the grid, the grid would fall, fall short. So, has there been any talk about that? Any uh, uh, any any consideration of that at all in your in your uh, uh, rulemaking process? Have you heard any concerns of that during the process at all? Chair Ingerbritson, thanks for the question. I will say that um, part of our focus is not only implementing the Clean Cars Minnesota standard, but maximizing federal investment in EV infrastructure and grid resiliency. And we, we can only accomplish that through partnership with others. And um, the Public Utilities Commission, I know, has actions in front of it. Just looking at right now that Director Kolash is um, much more familiar with. So I'll ask him to weigh in at this point about that. Thank you, Matt. Uh, uh, Chair Ingebrigtsen. And uh, when we did the analysis for Clean Cars Minnesota, we did not go out and uh, have any predictions. We had no basis, in fact, for uh, putting, including 
potential blackouts in Minnesota coming from electric vehicles. And again, that's looking at the regulation that was in front of us as um, Assistant Commissioner McDonald mentioned, and that was targeting a, about a, achieving about a six to 7% EV or plug-in hybrid um, vehicle sales by model year 2025. So we don't anticipate, and the, the sonar did not go into the potential for blackouts because there's no anticipation at that level that that's going to stress the grid and reliability. Uh, but to, to your question about the future and, and looking forward, that is the, the place at the Public Utilities Commission and as Commissioner Kessler mentioned in, in her opening remarks, uh, our major utilities have proposals in, in front of the Public Utilities, Utilities Commissions to talk about how they can uh, encourage that kind of vehicle adoption and support the charging of electric vehicles into the future while also maintaining the other charges of reliability and the, the uh, costs to Minnesotans being fair. So the, the Public Utilities Commission is where we are tracking a number of those dockets from those utilities about how they are going to uh, both provide uh, the, the benefits and support especially in, in their place EV charging infrastructure, but also then be able to support going into the future in a reliable and cost-effective manner the ability to charge those vehicles on the types of uh, generation that they have and that they predict to have for the future. In, in your uh, rulemaking process, can you tell me where the, where the uh, EV charging infrastructure and EV affordabilities are addressed? And is that part of the rulemaking process? Uh, Chair Ingerbritson, within the uh, technical support document and also within the sonar, if you want specific page number references, we'll have to provide those to you after, uh, after the hearing. I don't have those uh, right at my fingertips, but we did include the average cost for a vehicle, and this analysis was done in 2020, uh, and under the, at that point in time, federal regulations, which had set up a difference between what Clean Cars Minnesota would be and what the federal regulations would be. In this late December of 2021, that difference was nullified by the federal action. So now, while our analysis showed that, in general, a car, truck, SUV, van would cost maybe $1,200 more, and this is for a, a low emission vehicle, uh, a purchaser would save more than $2,000 over the life of that vehicle due to the efficiency of that vehicle, so it would be a net savings. But however, those costs are, are no longer applicable because, again, at the end of December of 2021, after we adopted Clean Cars Minnesota, the federal government changed their rules to be much more in line with the Clean Cars Minnesota rule so that we don't expect that there is any actual cost difference between the vehicles in Minnesota or any other state in the union because they all have to meet now the, the federal standards which are in align with the uh, current Clean Cars Minnesota and Advanced Clean Cars 1 standards that are in existence. Thank you. Getting back to the uh, uh, rulemaking authority for uh, EV charging infrastructure and, and affordability, is that I understand that's not under the purview of the rulemaking authority we're talking about. Uh, Chair Ingebrigtsen, what we were focusing on the cost was because that's required under Minnesota's Administrative Procedures Act that when we conduct the rulemaking that we do that kind of cost analysis as part of the state of need and reasonableness and then we included that and it's discussed and detailed in both the statement of need and reasonableness and the technical support document for the rule itself. So those were required by Minnesota statutes for the Administrative Procedures Act that we take that kind of analysis. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll have a couple. So I, I, I heard a few times, I'm just going to make a statement first, and I'll have a couple questions. Um, I think it, it's been questioned a few times why we're even here today, and I think the, one of the biggest reasons is there's a lot of confusion amongst the public as to, to why we're continuing this and what is actually going to happen based on what California has recently done with their announcement of banning the the sale of gas-powered vehicles coming in the near future with what I guess I would call California Cars 2.0 on, on their front. So um, there's one article that I read recently from MinPost that kind of sums it up well. It, it says that why would Minnesota move ahead with implementing the clean car rule if it's only going to be in effect for one year? And my understanding is, based on what you've said today, that this rule is only going to be in place for one year. So 
one, the biggest question I have is what, what is the purpose of doing this for one year? Commissioner. Chair Ingerbritson and Senator Eichhorn, um, as I've noted, the, um, each additional electric vehicle and low emission vehicle that is out, sold in Minnesota actually improves air pollution problems in Minnesota. So there is benefit by enacting and, and seeing the increase to consumers of choice and seeing consumers make that choice. So another well, question along that, that same kind of area is, you, this has to have cost the agency quite a bit of money to go through this process. Um, how much did it cost the agency, and not just the agency, but the state in general, if you know beyond your agency, what did it cost us to do this? And I'm trying to figure out, what, was there really some value to the state for what we spent for one year of, of California cars? Commissioner. Uh, Chair Ingerbritson and Senator Eichhorn, I'm going to ask uh, Assistant Commissioner McDonald to address the cost. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Commissioner, go ahead. Chair and Senator Eichhorn, um, to answer your question, the cost for our rulemaking was in line with what is contained in the Minnesota rulemaking manual process, which is about $450,000 for uh, a large rulemaking. I don't have the exact figure here, but that was at the last time that we pulled those costs. It was prior to the ALJ hearing, and the costs were about $350,000, so we were in line with what uh, a major rulemaking is. So in addition to uh, the cost for rulemaking, obviously there's cost of litigation. Do you know approximately what that will be? Chair Ingerbitson, we can follow up on the cost litigation. Perfect. I'd like a whole, kind of a holistic cost picture of what this is really costing the state. So if there's other areas as well, I would be interested in that. Um, the other area that you talked about, which was an area of concern, obviously, for a lot of folks, at least in greater Minnesota, was that the state is going to ban the sale of, um, of combustion engine vehicles. You said you're not planning at this point to continue with California Cars 2.0. And we appreciate that, but in a hypothetical scenario, if the state did decide to go into rulemaking on California Cars 2.0, would that result in the ban of combustion engines in this state? Commissioner. Chair Ingerbritson and Senator Oikern, I just want to reiterate that at this time we are not adopting advanced clean cars too, and that we're focused on clean cars Minnesota and an approach that makes sense for the state of Minnesota. If we were to proactively decide that we wanted to go through an additional rulemaking to adopt advanced clean cars too, there would be a long process that would be open to public input and it would again follow the rigor that you've heard others describe that includes a statement of need and reasonableness, an economic analysis, as well as an administrative law judge hearing. Again, follow up on oh. that, Mr. Chair. So if I realize you're not doing it now, but if the state were to do that, if we were to adopt the California Emission Standards 2.0 or whatever you want to call it, would the sale of combustion engines at that point be banned in the state of Minnesota? Commissioner. Chair Ingerbritson, um, I will describe what we know of California's standards, which are that they are on a path for ZEV, the, the, the emission standards that apply to electric vehicles, to have new cars in 2035 be 100% electric vehicles new cars sold in the state of California, and that is not something we are proactively doing right now in Minnesota. So my understanding is if we did adopt that, certainly we could end up at that point. Uh, part of the reason for concern is that a previous hearing, I believe it was in March, uh, earlier in March of this year, there was a comment made that if we have, if, if we've adopted California standards, which we have, Minnesota's only option, and here's the quote from the, the uh, committee that I wrote down, Minnesota's from the agency, I, I don't think it was you, Commissioner, but it was agency staff that had said this, uh, Minnesota's only option going forward would be to adopt future changes California might make to their emission standards. What we're hearing today is obviously something different, is something changed, or uh, is some, has something changed? Would, I guess would be important to know. Or, or do we actually have to look at potentially adopting those future standards? Commissioner. Uh, Chair Ingerbritson and Senator Eichhorn, I will reiterate that uh, at this point we are focused on implementing the rules in place in Minnesota and that the choices that Minnesota has going forward are either to follow the federal standards and if we take no proactive action, that will be the path that we are on or to go through any other rulemaking to adopt the Advanced Cars Clean 2 standard. And so 
the, the choices for Minnesota are the federal standard or the advanced clean cars standard too, and we are on the path of clean cars Minnesota until that sunsets at the end of model year 2025, at which point we will be on the federal emission standard path. So, so Commissioner, then, then the question, I guess, is that you said if and when uh, we would make that decision. So you are still leaving it open to possibly going with mirroring California emission standards. Chair Ingerbritson, I think what's important to note is that at this point we've heard that the federal government is going to release a draft new proposed standard in the first half of 2023, and that it's important to analyze at that time what the options are for the state of Minnesota and make the decision that is best in the interest of our state. So that's, that's an interesting comment. So the best interest of our state is, is going to be that of one person, not all of the state of Minnesota. And that's where I have the real, real issue here is uh, I'm hearing just wonderful things about EV cars and EV this and, you know, uh, saving, you know, making the air clear here in Minnesota, uh, not considering what North Dakota or South Dakota or anybody else is doing. We're just going to do it here in Minnesota. And it's such a great idea, I don't understand, and I never have, and I think I've, I've mentioned this before, that we do have, the legislature has given the, the, the governor, whatever governor, the rulemaking authority back in the, I, I can't remember what year it was. And to a certain degree, it makes a lot of sense. It really does, because we would be here full time making rules and passing, passing laws uh, but when it's something this big, it seems like, uh, and you folks are very convincing, at least the administration is very convincing that this is the right way to go. Uh, why? Why in the world would the uh, governor, why would the governor not say, you know, this is a conversation for 201 legislators that represent all of Minnesota, from Roseau as the dealer from CNM Ford is to, to wherever the other one is from, instead of just one person basically making that rule. It's just, it's just never made any sense to me if it's that good for Minnesota, then why wouldn't we all participate in that? What's your comment on that? Chair Ingerbritson, I will note that prior to uh, the choice to move through the Clean Cars Minnesota rulemaking process. We were looking at what, what is the landscape that we're dealing with in Minnesota. The federal government was rolling back the standards. We were not seeing a proactive action to uh, go in the path that we felt we needed to be on in order to meet the bipartisan Next Generation Energy Act. So to stay on the path to, to meet those goals that were set out by the legislature, we adopted through the through the public rulemaking process that includes lots of comments and options to weigh in the Clean Cars Minnesota standard. So I, I think weeding through all that, I, I'm probably reading, reading that the Trump administration had rolled the standards back. Is that correct? Uh, I mean, Chair that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, the about. rollback of the federal standards began in 2018. And now they're becoming more stringent under this administration, or at least that's the goal. It seems that way with this talk of the Green New Deal thing that, that seems to be creeping in all over the place. So I can only assume that's what it's all about. And, and uh, I, can, I can tell you that, and I don't care uh, where you go, uh, uh, when, they find, when, the, when the public understands that, that Minnesota's potentially going to follow the rules of California for anything, and I'm not going to go into other rules. I'm not going to go into social issues. I'm not going to go into anything else. Anything from California. It, it's just, it just blows my, my mind of that thought process without at least allowing the <clears throat> representatives and the senators from all of Minnesota to participate in this. So, um, Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had one more. I'm going to have yeah. two, actually. And I have three others. All right. Uh, Commissioner, uh, your agency and the governor recently, recently spoke at a press conference about the climate action framework that you're going to be putting into place, which called for 20% of vehicles on the road to be electric by 2030. 
Um, how, do you, how does the agency, how does the state plan to accomplish that without some curtailment of gas-powered cars? Maybe we can get there, maybe we can't. Um, and is that a hard target or is that something you're just hoping for? Um, so how do, you, how do you really plan to get to that point? That's what I'm asking. Commissioner. Chair Ingebretson and Senator Eichhorn, the development of the Climate Action Framework, which was informed by um, thousands of Minnesotans across the state, includes goals. So that is a goal. And we, at this point, are focused on making as many choices as possible available to vehicle owners, as well as building out a robust charging network and supporting Minnesota businesses that are supporting an EV transition. My last question, Mr. Chair, then I'll have just one Hold comment. Um, piggybacking on a question Senator Torres Ray asked earlier, and I appreciated the question, was uh, about how many hearings you guys had. You didn't answer necessarily how many hearings you had in greater Minnesota. I'm talking about like Bemidji and Brainerd and Roseau and East Grand Forks and uh, the Moorhead area. That, that's what I'm talking about, greater Minnesota, not like Elk yeah. River or something like that. What, can you tell me kind of where you had those and how many you might have had? Uh, Commissioner. Chair Ingerbritson and Senator Eichhorn, we're looking up exactly where they are, but um, our recollection is that there were five in greater Minnesota. Okay. So just my last comment, Mr. Chair, I, I, I thank you for having this conversation again today. I know some think it's not necessary, but I really think it was. I will piggyback on one other thing Senator Torres Ray said that I also appreciated that um, we, we haven't really heard from the companies yet. So if we do any of these um, hearings going forward on California car standards, I think we should try to invite some of the companies in. Um, I think they've been reluctant, even in other committees I've served in, the manufacturers to come in and, and speak with us. So I think that would be interesting to get their take. We've certainly heard loud and clear from the auto dealers. You and I have heard loud and clear from our constituents, which is obviously very different than our uh, DFL colleagues are hearing in their districts, and that's certainly just fine. There's a lot of contention about it. There's a lot of confusion about it. So I think it's important we continue this conversation so that Minnesotans have it out and open in the public. So thank you for the, the discussion, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Commissioner, for being here to, to answer our questions today. I'm sure there will be more, so I, hopefully you'll continue to make yourself available, as you always have, to, so we can forward our questions to you and, and make sure our constituents are aware of what exactly is going on. So appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Dibble, you're up next, and then Senator Lang. Um, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, cost earlier, and um, you know, if we're going to if we're going to be asking the agency for um, costs, I think it's fair to um, have a, a balanced read on what the costs are going to be, what the costs have been, and and will be. Um, you know, if we're, for uh, these rules and and what's going to really happen uh, in uh, the pocketbook of of Minnesotans, um, you know, it's important to note for the record that uh, no one is being forced uh, to buy uh, an EV, um, uh, but but those who do will experience a, a substantial uh, reduction in their transportation costs. Um, additionally, we will all benefit from improved air quality, uh, both in terms of our own health, should we be susceptible to becoming ill from uh, those illnesses that are caused or exacerbated by air pollution, but overall public health costs uh, go down as we improve our pollution situation in Minnesota. I'll note for the record that the Center of the American Experiment is not an objective reporter of the facts. Uh, they have an interest. They're funded through the fossil fuel industry in part. And so um, uh, the study and research that you cite um, should be uh, analyzed and, and received uh, in light of that. And then finally, Mr. Chair, um, you know, I think everything that has been discussed today, um, the information that you're at, the new information you're asking for probably could have been handled uh, through a telephone call that you could have made to the commissioner that would have been wrapped up in about five minutes. The only thing I've been hearing in this committee to date um, uh, is a discussion that we've had now in this committee uh, many times, uh, points you've raised many times on the floor of the legislature. Um, we seem to be plowing old ground, as I said before. I'm hearing nothing new um, uh, today, uh, just uh, complaints and grievances about the fact that we have a Minnesota Clean Cars uh, standard and you don't like that, that is well established, that is on the record. You've proposed legislation to try to defeat it and you've um, 
uh, made many, many speeches to that effect, and we've spent hours in this hearing. I feel like we're just simply repeating uh, past hearings. Uh, the new information is that uh, something uh, is changing in California, and um, and uh, there may be changes uh, at the federal level. Um, but the fact is, is that we have a Minnesota Clean Car Standard um, that will be in effect uh, granted for a shorter period of time. Again, could have been uh, wrapped up with a simple telephone call um, to find out what was going on. Um, otherwise, we're spending, uh, what, an hour or two um, simply restating things have been stated many, many times before in this committee and on the floor of the Senate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Lang. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner and uh, Assistant Commissioner. I guess as we've been going along and I've been listening uh, to the testimony here, I've been curious, uh, you know, and Senator Dibble did mention uh, the the other study that was uh, done and, and sort of the, you know, they probably do have a little different viewpoint of the, uh, the proposed rule, uh, but you did cite some increased price and the increased price that you cited was a little bit different than what uh, the other study had shown. In fact, it was, you know, about four times, uh, about 25 percent. So I'm kind of curious about the math. Is, is how do you get to that price? How do you how do you do the math um, when you say they're saving two thousand dollars for an increased twelve hundred dollar price? Um, and I think it was the assistant commissioner that actually uh, mentioned the fact over the life of the vehicle. So a couple of questions on that. What do you consider the life of the vehicle? Is it 100,000 miles? Is it 200,000 miles? Um, and where does that savings come from exactly? Commissioner McDonald, I believe. Uh, Mr. Chair, we're going to invite uh, Director Colash to talk about the technical details sure. of the analysis. Sure. Commissioner Colash. Uh, Chair Ingerbertson, Senator Lang, the uh, ability to compare the analysis is really Im impossible right now because we don't know what is in the, the other uh, study that has been cited. And, uh, and a lot of what we're going to find is, uh, depending on what is within the boundaries of that study, will make a significant amount of difference. If there's a, a lot of money that is uh, incorporated into that study about the costs of additional trans electrical transmission lines and elect electric generation, then that can change the cost analysis. Our, what I can say with our cost analysis is that we looked at. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm not talking about the study. I, I was talking about the $1,200 that the agency cited. I'm just curious about your math, not the, not the study. I think he wants, yeah. he wants the light. Uh, Chair Anderson, when we looked at the our analysis, we looked at a 10 year window and uh, 100,000 miles. And that's just mostly to put the boundaries on the analysis. We were following that kind of analysis from other states like Colorado who had done a similar analysis uh, and, and we were basing it on that. So we were trying to look at a reasonable amount of years, 10, 10 to 12 years, that 100, 150,000 mile um, range. That's, that's the general expectation right now for the lifetime uh, life use of a vehicle. We, we also know that the used market goes on much longer, but that was the boundaries for our analysis was to look at, at uh, those time, those year ranges and those mile ranges to make sure that we could make it reasonable to assume that some that a vehicle would be on the road for those amount of years and those amount of miles and that the consumers would be getting that benefit. Senator Lang. So, uh, so I guess the question is at 100 and let's say 100, 150,000 miles, somewhere in that range, did you factor in, uh, you know, battery placement electric vehicle? Uh, Senator Ingerbertson, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Chair, Chair Ingerbertson, Senator Ling, when we were looking at electric vehicles, we were looking at the impacts of the particular battery warranties that exist for electric vehicles, and many of those are going out to eight to ten years. So those were covered uh, generally by the, the costs of the automobile manufacturers warranting those drive systems and those battery systems going forward. But uh, we, we were looking at uh, attempting to replicate and analyze all of the costs a potential consumer would have over the life of that, that vehicle. Any follow-up? Yes. So I guess the question is, Yes, or is it no? <laughs> Uh, Chair Gerbertson, Senator Lang, uh, I would want to get back to you to make sure that I can adequately explain how we included the maintenance side of electric vehicles in, in that. I want to make sure that I'm correct on that. So I would like to get back to you with the more yeah, details absolutely. about if you, that. If you want to email me the entire mathematical equation, how you, how you came up, 
Uh, with that and variables, I, I would certainly enjoy uh, comparing both the study that Sanger and Merritt cited and, and the study that you guys have, have you've been using. Um, just a, a couple more questions that are you know, fairly mundane here, but um, how many how many vehicles are still in the state on an annual basis right now? Commissioner Chair yeah. uh, Britson, Senator Lang, uh, we generally uh, you know estimate there's around 220,000 vehicles, new vehicles sold every year. Okay, and what percentage of those uh, are going to be the, for the one model year, whatever it is? What percentage of those vehicles are going to be mandated to be electric? Chair sure. Britson, Senator Lang, we are estimating uh, between somewhere between six percent and seven percent of those vehicles would have to be qualifying as a zero emission vehicle, a battery electric hybrid vehicle, battery electric vehicle, or a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Okay, so we're well, talking anywhere between, you know, 50, say, fifteen thousand vehicles, correct? Let's use that number. Do, do we have an infrastructure right now that's capable of supporting an additional fifteen thousand electric vehicles? Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Chair Britson and Senator Lang, uh, we, we think we do. We obviously need to continue to build out the uh, public infrastructure, but what we do know is that for owners of a battery electric vehicle and a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, most of the charging that they have happens at their home, and that that's the kind of charging that they rely upon. Uh, but it is a focus of our, uh, both of the Push Control Agency and the Department of Transportation to continue to build out the public charging stations and encourage private investment in charging stations to make sure that consumers in Minnesota have all the choices that they need for their charging needs to go forward with their vehicles. Mr. Chair. Follow up. So 15,000 electric vehicles in the state of Minnesota, and we, we don't really know if we can support that. Um, you know, the, the agency is starting to really regulate an industry that they've never regulated before. I, I, I'm very hesitant to go into that having some uncertainty on whether or not we can support it on an electrical grid. I'm curious when they when, when individual charges their electric vehicle at home, and let's, I mean, for the for argument's sake, it's a, a standard Tesla model and they have a fast charger in their garage. Um, and I come from rural Minnesota and I, I have uh, several electrical co-ops in the area that I've uh, talked to and, and uh, you know, I, I was curious as to what the capacity was for these electrical co-ops and exactly what a fast charger means uh, for these for these grids. Uh, and I, I'm talking the, the actual tangible power production and what we can handle on a grid. Uh, and it was an interesting answer. And I'm, I'm just curious to the agency. And let's let's use my hometown, Olivia, Minnesota, for example. Um, do, do you know what an average block in uh, Olivia, Minnesota, can handle for fast chargers on an overnight basis? Chair yep. Herbert and Senator Link. Uh, no, we would not have access to that that type of information. So, and this is part of my concern is that as we go forward, we're not incentivizing the purchase of a electric vehicle; we're mandating it. That is a situation where the state of Minnesota really gets in a tough position. But we're forcing. It. Uh, I I personally don't have a whole lot of uh, angst against electric vehicles. I, I think over the course of the lifetime of the vehicle, the cost of ownership, the cost of replacing batteries, uh, and honestly, the cost of the roadways because of weight, because of uh, additional electrical grid issues all along the line, uh, are really, you know, arbitrary and, and and somewhat, you know, I don't know if it really pays off over the life of the vehicle. I, I've seen evidence in both ways. Uh, you know, we kind of pick and choose the things we'd want to use as evidence. Uh, but as of right now, some of the uh, the co-ops showed serious concern about the fact that they cannot, uh, in a small town Minnesota right now, handle a bunch of fast chargers on an overnight basis. Uh, those fast chargers have been compared to uh, a welder on a constant load on the overnight. You know, and and I, I asked the question, well, how many welders on a constant load can you have on the average city block? And the answer is maybe one or two. And that's what the electrical grid can handle. That's what was relayed to me. Now, I'm not an electrical engineer, and I don't know the, the, the formulas that the agencies are using to, to figure out what we can and can't handle, but uh, your answer of, well, we're not sure, doesn't necessarily uh, give me a whole lot of confidence in, in 
any agency that's regulated the industry that they've never done before. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I, I guess I don't have any additional questions. Thank you. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to say thank you to the commissioner. Um, a statement that she made is very important to me in my constituents, and I hope to the state of Minnesota in general. And that is that it's your job to make sure that our state adopt standards to reduce pollution in the environment. And as such, you need to look into new standards uh, for EV transition. That is your job, Commissioner. You need to continue to do that, and I fully support that. For me, it's interesting, and I want to tell my constituents and the public right now, there are 36 days to the election, and clearly we're having a meeting about California. Of all the things that we could be talking about, inviting uh, the vehicle industry, inviting people to talk about cost, inviting people to talk about the impact to the environment, we decided to talk about California. California, California, 36 days into the election, we're gonna talk about California today. To people in rural Minnesota, rest assured that I understand that I live in Minnesota and I represent Minnesota. I do not represent California and I don't wanna talk about California. I didn't call this hearing about California. So for the members who care so deeply about people in rural Minnesota, they should have a meeting in rural Minnesota to talk about the cost of electricity in Minnesota today. That should happen in the Energy Committee, by the way, because that is about energy. I am a member of the Energy Committee will welcome a meeting in the Energy Committee to talk about the cost of energy in the state of Minnesota, in rural Minnesota. But today, I wanna to tell rural Minnesota, we're not California, we are not acting like we are California. We're not gonna adopt rules from California. We're not banning anything in Minnesota because California is banning combustion agent, uh, uh, engines in California. We're not doing that. Don't have any fear that we're gonna act like legislators from California because we love our state and we're gonna do what is best for people in rural Minnesota, suburban Minnesota, and metro, because you matter to us. And we need to see, we need to hear from you. And Commissioner, I encourage you to have more meetings in rural Minnesota if necessary. Please do so. Because we believe that they agree with you that we need to do more to protect our environment and we need to understand the cost of this transition, but they want this transition. So thank you. Commissioner, for doing your job, and to the members that care so deeply about positioning this issue for rural Minnesota, saying that we are acting like we represent California. I want to tell my constituents, tell everyone that I don't. I do care about Minnesota standards, and I think we need to continue to talk about protecting our planet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Torres Ray. You know, we've always had good, heated discussions about things over the last years and, and uh, I've appreciated that and I'm so glad, I'm so glad to hear you uh, say that we should quit talking about California. Uh, I'm all for it. I really am. Uh, I hope the governor's listening because there's a whole lot of people out there that don't like us talking about comparing California with Minnesotans. So thank you for that but I do understand what you're saying. We do need to move on. Um, Commissioner, and Senator Eaton is next, but Commissioner, before I forget, uh, when, you, when you talk about your costs and your cost analysis, do you take into consideration uh, batteries? Uh, what, what do we do about recycling batteries? You know, that's been kind of an interesting, interesting uh, part of my career here, the 16 years that I've been here. I've been on this committee and chaired this committee for several years, uh, and we've always talked about different things for the environment. And I go home and tell everybody, well, in my chair, what are you doing in your, in your, your committee? I said, we do uh, walleyes, whitetails, and garbage is what we do. <laughs> so that's kind of, uh, kind of it in a short, but that's not, that's not totally it. And we certainly don't need to do anything about energy, but we do do things, a lot of things about recycling. And that's one of the biggest concerns too that I hear is, what are we gonna do with all these batteries? 
Now we know that they're stockpiling the uh, wind uh, turbine uh, 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 blades, uh, I think, in southwestern Minnesota, or southeastern Minnesota until some industry comes up, which I expect will happen, to be able to recycle them. Maybe you can help me out with that a little bit too as well. But you're going to have batteries that are going to go bad here. Um, is there any consideration as to what you're going to do with those batteries and, and how you're going to handle that and what the cost is? Chair Ingerbritzen, um, appreciate the characterization of your job. I think it's a, I could probably use the same reference. I'm, I'm sure my kids would think that's really cool. But um, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, I also appreciate the, the reference to recycling because I think that this is another area where we could see innovation in Minnesota and ec economic opportunities and support businesses and high paying jobs. And so I think we should all be in the business of thinking about how to recycle the elements as we move into this energy transition, whether that's wind turbines or solar panels or EV batteries. And um, I, I, you heard Director Kolesh say that the cost of batteries and the maintenance of batteries in terms of that, that 10 year window of life was included in the analysis. I'll ask him if he wants to weigh in more about recycling, but I think that is a challenge in front of the state. And frankly, I would hope one that we could think of as an economic opportunity. Mr. Kolesh. Chair Ingebrigtsen, yes, uh, the recycling and the maintenance of those batteries will be critical, and that's something that's happening at the international level and particularly at the federal level within the last one to one and a half years of folk at the Department of U.S. Department of Energy, the U.S. Geologic Survey, looking at making sure that we recover as many of those critical materials and minerals out of those batteries as possible and recycle those in. That's part of recent legislation that was involved about making sure that when we have new electric vehicles being made that we're focused on providing incentives to the automobile <laughs> manufacturers so that they are using recycled critical minerals. So we're actively looking at that. We do know that uh, these batteries have residual value to them, so if they no longer have a useful life as powering a vehicle, they can be used for other purposes and on secondary markets, and they're also used for um, the hobbyists who want to convert uh, on a hobby basis, a vehicle to electric vehicle, but we anticipate that that's going to be something we'll be working with our federal partners about making sure that, uh, as Commissioner Kessler noted, that we're taking opportunities for the economic advantages of recycling those batteries because it will be critical that we get the, the critical minerals um, from those batteries and recycle them into new batteries and new uses going forward. So, so basically, that I mean, that's all good stuff. I mean, it's all, you know... Again, let the let the industry work, uh, the recycling industry or hobby, whatever you want to call it. But we still have not figured out what that cost is. Is what you're telling me? Is that is that included in the cost of the vehicle? Maybe Mr. McDonald can can tell me about that with regards to the costs. Chair Ingerbritsen, um, as Director Colash said, uh, we were looking at the vehicle manufacturers and them covering the replacement cost of that, and that's part of that ongoing warranty piece. So we'll follow up on the, the specific details of the cost and how batteries were included in our cost analysis. You'll follow up with that? We'll follow up. Yeah. Thank you. Senator Eaton, sorry it took so long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I guess first I want to say that um, I'm concerned there's ongoing litigation that's currently playing out in the courts over clean cars. And the legislature has a long history of not getting involved in court proceedings. So I don't understand why we're doing this. Um, this should not be different. Um, also, I'd like to say that what's been presented, there's really nothing new. Um, we haven't, we've already discussed this basically we're as a, uh, my colleagues, Senator Dibble said, we're literally relitigating the existing rule. I don't think we have um, any need to be having this hearing. Um, I, I, you know, I don't want to be too offensive, but it does seem purely like a political stunt in advance of the election, and I'm um, pretty offended by it, to tell you the truth. Okay. Was there any question with that? I'm sorry. Just comment. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's an election coming up. We all know about that. Um, but that was not a, at all why this was called. This was called because of the changes that were going on. And 
Um, I think the commissioner, as well as Senator Dibble, knows my concern about this. Uh, whether they agree with me or not, uh, I still have the opportunity to, to be able to uh, at least look at things and, and try and get a commitment from the commissioner as to whether, uh, whether the commissioner or the governor is going to move forward with California emissions. And here's that word California again. And I, and I hope, uh, you know, that that doesn't happen because uh, uh, to compare with a state that has rolling blackouts and uh, problems that they have out there is not something that we should be comparing to. Um, with that, uh, members, if you have any other questions, if not, uh, I do have the auto dealers that would like to make a couple of comments here before the end of the time allotted. Uh, so, Amber, if you'd come forward. Thank you, commissioners, for so much for, the, for your time. Ms. Backus, welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Auto Dealers Association. And I wasn't planning to speak today, but there were a couple comments I did want to respond to. I do appreciate that uh, Commissioner Kessler and I are wearing the same colors today, because I think by and large, we are on the same team in terms of we want to do things to improve Minnesota's air quality, and as well, we want to help with the transition to electric vehicles. We just have a very different opinion about the direction and the policy uh, choice to get there. Um, but I did want to say that it is big news, and this is something that's changed, that our um, Clean Cars Minnesota is going to only be in effect for one year. And it's a big deal in the minds of our dealer members and consumers because it's going to be a year that's going to have a great deal of uncertainty in the marketplace. Uh, when Clean Cars Minnesota was proposed in 2019, that was before COVID, that was before supply chain disruptions, that was before the feds decided to change their standard, that was before California had decided that they would undergo changes in their standards. Um, and while uh, we got a hint that some of those things would be coming later on once the rulemaking started, we still decided to move forward. And here we are having a rule that's going to be in effect for one year. Uh, and I say it's a big deal because in uh, 2024 then, as um, Mr. Kalash alluded to, um, there will probably be uh, 15,000 vehicles uh, that will have to be electric vehicles for sale in Minnesota. And um, uh, it is going to be the dealers that will have to buy those. That's when the manufacturers satisfy their requirement under the rule. So dealers um, will need to buy that many. Um, it won't be every dealer. Um, but it will be a subset of dealers that will have that inventory in their possession. And those are vehicles, while there is uh, you know, a demand, and we're seeing waiting lists right now for EVs, we're seeing waiting lists because the manufacturers have announced new vehicles that are coming to the marketplace that aren't for sale yet. And people can pay $100 to put their name on the waiting list, but that doesn't mean they're gonna buy those electric vehicles. Uh, typically, about 50% of customers that put their name on a waiting list will buy them. So yes, there's some interest, but it's not gonna be as uh, big as what we see. But our dealers that will have to buy those vehicles are going to be buying them at a time when we're going to see prices of all vehicles continue to accelerate because of the supply chain shortages, um, it's gonna make them more expensive. Uh, when this rule was proposed, uh, the expectations were there would be parity between the price of electric vehicles and uh, gas-powered vehicles, and actually we're seeing the opposite happen. Uh, due to mineral prices right now and supply chain disruptions and sourcing issues around the world, electric vehicles are now costing $18,000 more than the average gas-powered vehicle, um, the average price being $66,000. Um, and then as well in 2024, we're probably not going to have any federal tax credits to help offset that differential. Uh, the new requirements passed under the Inflation Reduction Act are going to have, give you a tax credit for EVs, but that's if battery components, or excuse me, if minerals are sourced in certain countries and then the battery assembly happens in the United States. Um, the Alliance of Automotive Innovators recently put out an article that no EVs will qualify um, for those requirements, and um, I'm guessing that will probably be true in 2024 when we have this. So we're gonna have very expensive EVs that the dealers must buy at a time when there aren't going to be any sort of uh, consumer incentives available to them, and so I think that's gonna cause continued disruption in a marketplace that's already disrupted due to inventory shortages. So I just wanted to share that with the committee, 
And especially in light of the fact that this is just gonna be a one year rule, it doesn't make sense to me. I think there's a lot of things we could do to help with the transition to electric vehicles and their policies the state could pursue in terms of consumer rebates and helping with our charging infrastructure. But mandating supply for one year in a market that's already upside down isn't the way to go. So with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, members. Any questions of the testifier? I should be looking at my screen here. Thank you very much. Well, members, um, I'm sorry. Senator Lang. Oh, Senator Lang. Sorry. Uh, I do have a question for Ms. Bacchus if she didn't walk away. Okay. Yet. I'm sorry. What, what is her, uh, the Automobile Dealers Association, uh, what do they think the average price increase on a vehicle will be? Get a third party involved in that conversation. Ms. Bacchus. Uh, sure, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I think that we did think there was going to be a price differential for all vehicles for Minnesota to have a standard that was different than the rest of the country. Uh, but as Mr. Kolash said, there's now looks like there's going to be harmonization between the federal standards and the Minnesota California standard for low emission vehicles. So um, fortunately, we're not going to see that price differential. I think that was talked about in the sonar. But that being said, that harmonization also means we're not going to see any different environmental benefits um, than other states either, which is another reason just to go forward with the feds at this time and not, not have a rule in place for one year that's going to be so expensive for Minnesota dealers and consumers. So <clears throat> do you have a follow-up there? So you mentioned about the... Uh, uh, the minerals that are going to have to be purchased in different countries or whatever, and, and, and they're, they're not going to get a rebate. Is that going to be, uh, at least in your opinion, is that going to happen to California as well? I mean, they're not going to be able to get cost rebates because of where the, where the production came from? Um, Mr. Chair and members, um, they will not be eligible for the federal tax credit that's been in place, that $7,500 credit, that'd be nationally. But California does have very robust consumer incentive programs that Minnesota doesn't have. I think since they started with their ZEV program, they've invested upwards of $800 million in consumer rebates to try to negate the price differential. And we have nothing similar here in Minnesota. Okay, but the, it would call, the federal rebate wouldn't be, wouldn't be the yes. same, so. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Just a follow-up, since Senator Tomasoni is no longer with us, I uh, feel obligated to mention what he would mention in that we do have the critical minerals needed right here on the Iron Range, right here in northern Minnesota, to be able to supply not only Minnesota's need for electric cars, windmills, solar panels, but all of our country. So hopefully we can get our agencies to look at permitting those a little different so we can let them go forward so we can have the green economy that everybody wants so we're not sourcing those minerals from places that come from conflict areas which is happening right now unfortunately we do have a very robust uh, mining industry in northern minnesota and we should look for ways to support that so we can support the green economy great anything further well, thank you all for, uh, for coming. Uh, I'm sorry some of you think it was a waste of time, but it was not, in, at least in my view, and hopefully the public got a little more informed on, on what, uh, what's happening with regards to uh, all the uh, uh, good and bad rumors that are going around out there about electric cars. And uh, it sounds like we're gonna be uh, moving forward. The industry is gonna be moving forward with uh, competing against the combustion engine, at least for a little while. Um, but uh, folks are, are still out there very concerned, and, and I hope this makes it a little more clear. So with that, members, if there's no further questions or comments, we'll call the meeting adjourned without my gavel. There's my gavel. This might be my last one, too. I'm going to have to use my knuckles. So thank you again. <laughs>